All right. Good. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you are in the world joining us, uh, this is Tab from Resistance, also Mythical Games. Uh, I want to just give a quick shout out to all of the uh, folks who are joining us. I mean, incredible numbers, incredible numbers. Give yourself a pat on the back. I think we're close to 180 people uh, that have registered for the event, and I'm sure more will <laughs> join us in, in post. Uh, and I was just talking, about, talking to the panelists behind the the um, you know in backstage before we got started, and and Sten was quick to remind me. You know, we we've we've really just started this effort. We're seeing such engagement from this crowd. It's really also uh, because of a lot of people on this panel, right? Who 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 talked with me a couple of weeks ago bought into the concept and really have been just superstar players behind the scenes, helping out the group um, and, and really building us uh, for the future. So, you know, prayer hands, right? Hashtags, uh, you know, show these guys some love uh, when, when you have some time after the recording. But what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go around the horn and I think everybody knows why we're here, right? We are talking about building non-fungible communities. I think that's a great sort of uh, title for what we're describing here. So. Let me introduce all of the fellas that I have. Um, they're going to give you a little bit of overview about themselves, their companies, and then we'll jump into it. I see we're already getting some comments. I love you guys. I see you're, you're coming in with the good mornings and the hellos. Um, keep the questions going. You know the deal here. Throw them in there. We'll address them. We'll address them. Sorry. And on my screen, I'm going to go to Sten first, and then we'll just sort of um, actually, Sten, I, I faked you out there. Oh, no. I am going to go to Sten first. So, uh, Sten, I'm going to bring you up on the front here. Do you want to just give a little bit about yourself and your company? Yeah, of course. Well, first, hi, everyone. My name is Ten. I've been into uh, marketing for 12 years, and I'm helping a lot of NFT projects, you know, with their launch, with their mint, because there are still a lot of um, misinformation and a lot of companies that are transitioning from Web 2 to Web 3, and they are definitely need some help with that. And that is what I'm doing. So I'm helping these uh, projects, you know, with advising, marketing, and uh, other things like that. So we can talk about more of that later when you guys have questions. So that's that's, uh, that's in a nutshell about me. Yeah, but Mark, I got you on the stage there. Sorry, I was hey, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Mark Forscher. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy Wednesday, everyone. Um, I'm the founder of DigiBridge, uh, a Web3 data-driven marketing agency. Uh, I've been full time in this space for the last two and a half years, um, having experience working with new innovative tech startups uh, in new emerging markets, uh, as well as even L1 blockchains. Um, and, you know, the experience that I've gained from participating, investing and working with these projects, seeing the ups and downs um, from the marketing end has um, built up a lot of experience on my end on on the launching tactics, uh, the, the the strategy behind everything. And so, again, it's awesome to be here. And I'm also happy to have uh, the rest of my team, Richard Seifler and Stephen Forstner, to be here too. So I'll let them take it away when it's their time. But again, it's an honor to be here and to speak to everyone today. Wonderful. I got to get better with this mute button, guys. You, those of you have been with me since the first episode, you can see I'm getting, I'm getting better already. Josh, I got you on the main stage. Uh, Give us a little bit about yourself, man. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for making time today as well. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun to get on the panel with all you guys and uh, have a great, uh, great group here. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm the founder of Rocket Now. So we're a uh, full Web3 marketing agency. We do like zero to like sold out. Uh, we, I've been marketing for over 15 years. I've done, uh, our company's done over like 1.5 billion in sales since 2014. Uh, we've done uh, um, probably like the most hardcore ROI driven path to uh, get to uh, as many successes as possible and 100% love every chance we can all like collab like this and uh, share resources and knowledge and uh, help uh, more people be successful and all of us dodge more uh, bullets so yeah i really really appreciate it thanks guys excellent josh excellent josh and i'm going to bring up uh rich here rich you want to give a little bit of your about your your illustrious past yeah greetings all um my name is richard schweifler uh, i'm the founder of uh quite a well a few companies including uh the marketing foundation and nft art gallery uh, I have over 20 years experience in marketing, um, 
during that time, I was one of the leading Google partners uh, in the world. And uh, I have since then, uh, you know, since the Beeple moment, um, I was uh, one of the largest collectors at one time of NFTs. Uh, so I have, you know, deep into the scene, um, not just uh, playing on, on the sidelines and kind of making the things happen. So, you know, welcome. And I'm so excited to share the alpha today. Wonderful, wonderful. And then last but certainly not least, I am going to bring up uh, my buddy Steven here, Mark's brother. Hey, give you so, a little self about yeah, yourself. Sure. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, thank you again for having me on here. And uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, my name is Steven Forschner. And like you said, I'm brothers with Mark. So I began uh, full time in Web3 about a year and a half ago. And um, ever since, you know, I, I, I've just loved everything about it, especially the community building aspect. Um, that's why I'm more so into NFTs now. Um, I've worked with over 60 projects in my time, uh, both NFT, crypto, and metaverse. And uh, yeah, I've worked with you know some top 500 uh, crypto projects. So there's been a lot of uh, experience coming from our side, and I'm very excited to share some alpha with you all. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Now I'm going to bring everybody back up here. Um, hopefully this works the way it should. Yep, wonderful. Cool. All right, so I want to jump into it. I saw a question here a second ago, and I think this will be really just sort of a good live hand grenade to throw into the group. Um, what is a good marketing budget for a project that is essentially launching, right? So Sten, I'll start with you just because you're at the top, buddy. Uh, but guys, just sort of roll in and, and, and we can sort of build through and talk through a narrative here if, if you want to. And then uh, also audience, definitely, you know the deal. Keep throwing questions. If you hear if you're one of us, say something you want to hear more about. These sessions are meant to uh, really get down into details, not talk in platitudes. So uh, throw them at us. Yeah, so it kind it it kind of depends on different factors, right? I mean, how many NFTs were you planning to sell? Um, in what time frame? Do you already have a community, or do you start from scratch? I mean, there, there for me at least, I always tell the founders there are no no right answer because it depends on many factors. I mean, for example, a few projects that I've worked with um, had budget like 100k, 400k. But that's definitely not ne necessary to, you know, to have a successful launch or to have a successful mint. So again, it's, you know, you definitely, in my opinion, you definitely need a budget, but you know, it doesn't have to be like really big, like two hundred fifty k, five hundred k, or something like that. So I yeah, don't know so, what that. Yeah. I, I was going to say so. So to that, yeah, I mean, with with the whole budget thing, you know, I, I think that's that's a great place to start, but also. Uh, one place that, that we like to focus on is, is how involved do you want to be? Uh, what's the time frame, right? So, I mean, a lot of these projects, I mean, I, I think we're coming into an evolution now where it's not, you know, hey, I have this vision and, you know, let's get the money and do it. Um, so even for us, I mean, we're, we're more demanding on what we see, right? There's an evolution where people need to see something. Like we need to see work in progress or something that's nearly complete, hopefully complete, um, and from that point, if, if you have the marketing content, right, you, you have all the, the nitty gritty, like everything that it really takes, like if you build it, they will come. Um, and, and that's the other thing too, a lot of, you know, we're, we're coming from, uh, fr from an era where influencers, easy, quick gains, uh, you know, things like that. And influencers are great, don't get me wrong, but, but we are getting into, you know, a place where we need to see more, there has to be something there. And I'm so happy to say, you know, just from everything that we've been meeting with the DigiBridge and, you know, the NFT Art Gallery, um, that there are quite a few projects that are like, whoa, this is what I was looking for. So get ready, everybody, you know, big things coming and the players that actually have it that have done the work and have prepared are going to succeed along with the future proof community experience. So those things tied together, you know, if, if you have that, your marketing budget can be cut down, you know, exponentially, right? So, I mean, that, that's the biggest thing is do you have the content, what do you have, and how can we build a story around it to quickly hit the masses? And and also, you know, are you gonna use data or are you just gonna go hit, and hit in the dark, right? And we can talk more about that later, but. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's a great point, uh, Mark, uh, Richard, that you bring up there about um, how involved do you wanna be? Because I've certainly seen you know, projects that I've been around in the past where maybe they've been uh, celebrity based, 
you know, and that can maybe be a trap in itself, right? Celebrity, you know, often will will make you think, hey, it's gonna, it's it's just it's just gonna be dynamo, man. I mean, who wouldn't want to do this with this celebrity? But then yeah, often, if I may, if I may yeah. add to that too, like do. I was a part of, uh, I, I was a part of a DeFi project. I remember um, last year, and um, you know, they they were talking about all the marketing, setting up expectations for the community, right? And everyone was getting so hyped, including me. I was I was getting really really happy. I was heavily invested into the project. And then it came out that a celebrity was the one that promoted it. And it ended up completely destroying the momentum because no one from that celebrity's side even knew anything about crypto. And it ended up really being a mess on that end, too. So and, and they spent a lot of money on that uh, one celebrity just to promote them. So it was just something I experienced. And I was like, wow, I, <laughs> you know, these projects got to really manage their budget uh, um, and allocate it correctly in terms of who they're looking to promote it and the audience that they're trying to target and stuff like that as well. So I just want to uh, add that. Yeah. Uh, that's definitely a good point, Mark, because a lot of you know new projects and people that are new in the Web3 space, they think, oh, we have some kind of celebrity uh, project that must go viral and we, you know, we sell out and we stay successful. But that's, that's not how it works, especially because you know, people get more educated every day and they realize that these, you know, influencers or even celebrities, they are endorsing or promoting, you know, multiple projects every week. And yeah. in, they don't longer have the impact that they used to have because people are like, well, this person promotes like, I don't know, dozens of projects. Yeah. So um, can we take them serious? And um, yeah. another point, another good point is that, you know, their fans or their community, they have no idea about Web3, they, most of them have never heard about MetaMask or, you know, or, or NFTs. They're like, yeah, they're like pictures, right? <laughs> like, no, they're more than just pictures. But yeah, that, uh, that's I a think, good point. Yeah. I think I read like a recent statistic. And I don't know how, how accurate this is, but I believe what I read um, earlier was that around 500,000 wallets have NFTs um, in yeah. total. And that's such a small, like, think about the world population. It's like 0.003% <laughs> of the world. And, and so there's a lot of education, information that needs to be disseminated accordingly and, and the targeting needs to be in that sense too. So yeah. it's just, again, some of the things I've noticed from some of these projects that I've been participating and working with, um, how they allocate that budget accordingly with the celebrities that they use to promote and the influencers as well. Yeah, I totally agree with the, uh, the budget thing. Is like, it's really like down to like how cheap you are uh, or how cheap your marker is. Like I'm the cheapest uh, uh, person of all time. When it comes to anything but is like uh yeah if you if you if you have like uh, a team that is gonna go the distance uh has like is gonna put up uh like the effort and not gonna like just kind of give up after one month or give up after like two months or three months when they like and to get it to uh, uh the level that needs to be i mean like you can definitely get get by with with a really i was like like, uh, like, like you're saying, exponentially smaller budget. And um, I think I had like one, uh, we had like one guy, I think he had like, I think it was like four per four people in his Discord. And we managed to, he managed to do, I think it was like 60,000 in sales off uh, those four people. So it was like, and then we were able to leverage that to uh, uh, take his project to like a really high uh, um, uh, investment company. And it was like, but it was like, it's like you never really, it's like uh, it's not always about volume. It's sometimes about like quality, and uh, yeah. sometimes you need to focus on your sales as well. Yeah, so, so you know, to that, so I I think it's great that you're lean, but I, I will say, I mean, I I think when it comes to lean, I mean, I we have one of the leanest systems where I come from, and and I and what what allows us to be lean is really the the data, right? So and I, I will leave on this note. I know we're all about community, but right now where we're coming from, right, we have data where we've actually mapped. A lot of the, the so you want to look at, so right now for a lot of the stuff that you're looking for right algorithms how do how do the audiences react we don't have a lot of time a day is a month if not a year sometimes in this scene and so right now the biggest thing is mapping the winners looking at their data their touch points the customer's journey knowing where like so if you want to be lean it's it's knowing where to focus that laser right because when you come in if you don't have the data you have to activate everything spend a lot of time and a lot of money but if you know where to put the, 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 the press releases, if you know, you know, the, the different areas, the touch points where people are gathering, you can quickly hit all those on top of having, you know, collabs, partnerships, and, and, you know, the whole thing that, you know, and that's why, again, you want to partner with a marketing company 
that has, you know, a nice NFT collection that, you know, that's deep into the scene that may be able to guide you into having collabs and partnerships with partnerships and projects that they're into, right? So, so a lot of those things, when you're looking for what you want to do, look at your competition, look at the marketing companies and what they have to offer. And, and I think you'll quickly see, you know, who, who the winner is, right? The cream always rises to the top. Oh, and, and Richard, I think that's a great point. That's uh, I like totally agree. And I a hundred percent on the same path is uh uh, reverse like engineering uh, the successful projects and understanding like what influence did what. I think that's a brilliant strategy. I, I like also we also do like similar things. Is kind of like just like you just take out the gambling uh, aspect of it. And also I should like I, I want to add into like obviously like the higher the budget like the uh, easier it's going to be of course. And usually if it's a higher budget you're going to have a bigger team and a, and a more it's going to be a lot more business experience often in those situations. But yeah, I, I totally, I'm totally on the same page as you. Like, it's really uh, like having the the right um, company that's also like really well connected in like the, say it's like a, uh, to the projects or uh, platforms that you want to be on as well. So yeah, I totally agree. I think you're like dead on with that as uh, as well with like you, there is tools to like understand and remap uh, uh, the actual uh, buyer influence on. Uh, pretty much like any project that's out there. Cause like blockchain is great. It's, it's a full traceable system. And uh, yeah, it's like, just like, it's like a lot of work, but like, that's kind of uh, uh, it's like well worth it in, in my opinion too. Yeah. Yeah. And also from those tools, it's not just mapping the touch points, but the words, right? So mm -hmm. you'll find some of these collections, there were certain words, uh, maybe sometimes two or three words, long tail keywords that, that, mm -hmm. that they got, they acquired 80% or more of the traffic from, right? So it's things mm -hmm. like that shortcuts that data will allow you to have a very lean, mean budget. And yeah, dude, I, I love this group. We got a very intelligent group here. Let's keep it coming guys. Yeah. I want to, um, I want to, I want to touch on, you know, what kind of wrap that up in a package, right? It's, and, and this is sort of what Felipe was going to in the comments, right? Lean systems, as long as you've got a strong team, right? Budget is variable. It doesn't necessarily an indicator of success, but it certainly helps. Um, but I wanted to touch on a question that Aaron had had in, hit in the chat. And Aaron, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, it's story-driven, innovation, or ethos. Which of those categories do you think have the most success? Story. I'll just, I'll just do, is it anybody right now? Okay. Do this then. Yeah, I'll just repeat it again. Um, uh, which types of projects works work best with communities? Story-driven, innovation, or ethos? Is this for anybody or do we have anybody that wants to yeah, go? Anybody take it. So, yeah. so, so it, it's story driven. All right. All the way around. So, so I'm going to get, so when you look at, at what, what triggers us to act and motivates us, it's not data, it's not numbers, it's emotion. And there were Ted talks on this. And the one thing I tell, I tell so many clients, all right, is, is, so I have children, all right? I'm 42 years old. I got children aged from like six to 21 years old. Um, and so one of the things is my, my son watched a, a cartoon, uh, Star Wars right or uh star trek you know when they're out there shooting all the little guys in the spaceships right and even in a child's uh cartoon you can get away with eliminating spaceships blowing things up as long as the child they never show who's in those spaceships right so the whole thing about story emotion story and emotion is the way into the mind to get one to act numbers and about you know statistics they validate and they motivate and they help guide us but it's emotion and a story that because like you, you need to develop that connection and grow the, the, the you know the, the whole synapses and, and you'll get the brain firing up and a story is, is the ultimate way for, for anything it's messaging the story the content right that is king but now you're right look at the biggest brands in the world you know they sell emotions and they you know they sell feelings they sell dreams they don't sell products you know they they sell what could be and that is you know um, I definitely agree with you on that. It is a story that reaches the people, but it is data that backs it up, you know, to to analyze and see uh, how you can improve and in which areas you can improve. Um, but uh, definitely story is first, always. Let me throw a curveball at, at the folks who haven't jumped in on this one yet. Um, is it story-driven innovation and ethos, right? Is it all of that? And if it is, what's the force rank priority prioritization of that? Like what's number one, number two, number three? So I want to jump in. I just want to add to the previous one was uh, like uh, one thing that I found uh, that I was like always trapped in for a very long time was uh, thinking that the uh, 
the images or the uh, media content had more uh, impact than the actual like words on the page. So like, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally uh, like, I think all the guys had it correct. Yet, is that, uh, it's like entirely story driven. Like you can have uh, a blank page with just uh, a great story and that'll like sell like t 10 million times uh, more than uh, like the greatest images with like no story basically. So I think it's like a huge, super huge hack uh, the guys are dropping on that one. Yeah, definitely. And and hype works as well because, you know, a lot of, let me just be blunt, a lot of shit projects, you know, they are successful because they have a great story and they, uh, you know, they're able to create hype and really good projects, you know, they're building in silence. They don't have the hype, but they have innovation, right? So I, I saw somewhere uh, in the comments about, uh, I don't know anymore. Uh, but yeah, definitely for me, storyline innovation. I think those are two that, yeah, for me, that's, those are two the most important things. Yeah, there's um there's a project that I um <clears throat> I got caught on to early on. Um, they really caught me with their story at first. Um, and and then after that, I, I when I dug into it more, not only from their team, but the innovation standpoint of what they were building. Um, I was really blown away by it and made me really want to jump in. And not only that, right. I recommended it to all of my friends and even my family. And I know Steven has heard me talk about the project that I'm mentioning consistently because I, I just believe in it so much. And, and so that the story really got me at first. And then after I saw that, the, the innovation that I saw they were building upon and, and their, their vision, they sold me on it really well. Um, and so, yeah, that, that, that would be my order too. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I truly think that, you know, the story really, um, it captures your attention initially. And that's what, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, tend to don't realize is, you know, at least for me, when I come into a project, at least on the NFT side, um, you know, I really, I, I make sure if they have lore, I'm reading it. If they have certain things that they're showing off, I'm reading it, I'm checking it out. I want to make sure, you know, I'm always doing my research. And, you know, the main thing here is like, you know, the storyline is what gets you in, but innovation is what keeps you up. You know, through bull or bear, if you have innovation, it's it's always going to, um, you know, thrive, you know, eventually. You know, it all depends on when you deliver and all that. But I think the storyline is what gets people in through the doors and to actually look and value your project uh, quickly. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think Trevor in the comments. Trevor, good to see you, buddy. Um, and good luck with what you're, what you're working on, by the way. Um, he, he says connecting two to three out of five high, high level ideas that people can relate to are key here. And I think that's, that's a real solid, whenever I even talk with founders and I'm looking at like early stage decks, one of the things that I'll challenge them with is I'll say, what's your, what's your 30 word hook, right? Like what can you put on the first slide where if I didn't see the rest of the deck, I could get it. And that's, um, I think that's key, you know, that translating that idea, transmedia, um, which, which of course, um, transcends all mediums. So I want to ask a, a question that I have been sort of thinking about in my mind over the last few months, and I don't want to uh, give away my bias here, but I want to ask, how does, how does the group here uh, feel about influencer marketing? And we can, uh, maybe we can go bottom to top here. We, we can start with Steven and, and then work uh, back up the step. Yeah, sure. So my personal opinion is, you know, I came from an influencer marketing background, but I, I slowly, I, I, I think it has its own benefits, uh, you know, but I don't think it's as efficient as people really see it as. I mean, I'll talk to certain projects who will be like influencers, 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 but they have no idea like how to use them correctly. They just want to throw it at their product and hope it sticks. You can't, you know, just throw it and hope it sticks. So anyways, yeah, that's, that's my opinion is. I feel influencers, uh, they have their own purpose, um, the way you use them and making sure that you can use them appropriately. And of course on the legal side, um, but yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to add on to that a little bit too, cause um, you know, Steve and I both came from that, that influencer side, uh, managing, you know, uh, multiple campaigns, um, over six figure campaigns for, for companies. And again, like one of the things I noticed with, with the influencer side of things is, um, well, for one, I spoke, we, we spoke to a, a project where they had an allocated budget every month for, for influencer marketing. And, and one of the things that they weren't doing was even tracking the data behind it. And it really it blew my mind because 
you're throwing so much money over five figures plus a month into influencer marketing and not even understanding how much ROI you're actually getting from that. Um, and I think not only that, but also choosing the right influencers is key. Like, um, I've seen many projects, like I mentioned before, they choose celebrities, um, where they have, they have no education on crypto or what their project even does, why it's, why it's beneficial to them in the first place. Right. Um, and so it's really key on that end. And also like Steven mentioned the legal standpoint too. Um, I think authenticity with influencers is, is really, um, key when it comes to this. And, um, you know, I would love to see more influencers at least mentioning that <laughs> their posts are sponsored and, and things like that, because it's super important for their community to know what they're getting into. Um, especially if they've been nurturing the influencers themselves have been growing their audience and nurturing their community for time over time. Um, it's again, you saw the pricing list come out, uh, I believe a couple months ago with all these celebrities and influencers. Um, and it really put a lot of uh, backlash on, on that end, um, to an extent. So it's just something that, um, I, you know, I think on my end too, and also, um, working with micro influencers too, all the way up to macro. I mean, again, budget depending, it, it really, you can do a lot of things to really be lean on that end too, if, if you're really creative and intuitive on that end. So I'll leave it there. I'll see if anyone else has any more comments on that. Uh, so, so, I mean, influencers for me, I mean, I respect it as a marketing tool. Um, and I think that's, you know, why DigiBridge and I, you know, came together uh, was because I was bringing more of a hybridized, you know, omni-channel approach um, that, that really focuses more on, on the content and like, you know, the, the other facets of, of marketing, right? Uh, PR, you know, the, the journey, the data. Um, so for that, I mean, I, I really see, you know, influencers, uh, if it's not done right, uh, you know, if you don't find the proper people that really believe in the project and if you don't use data and you don't have everything laid in right, it's kind of like fireworks and you, you have it go up and you have quickly, you know, you, you lose your, your, your uh, momentum, right? But if you have data and you have, uh, you know, different conversion code, tracking code in place, and, you know, you've done your research, and that added into a, a really great campaign where they have great messaging, great content to talk about, and they're really part of the project that believe in it, great. But now the other thing, you know, again, what we've been gearing for uh, is, is we do predict, right, in the very near future, I mean, the government's here, right? Uh, you're seeing developers that have had some issues, some, you know, some other things like that, but there will be more regulation we're expecting in the very near future. And you will see uh, influencers, you know, have requirements, right, um, as we do for ours, that you have to, you know, there, there are certain rules that have to be followed that a lot, that we're not seeing a lot of individuals follow, like stating that you're being paid to make this claim, right? So, so those things, when, when they really come full swing, you may, you know, we're expecting that maybe the influencer model doesn't have the uh, biggest effect, and it's those that adapt quickest that are going to survive and thrive. Yeah, if I may add one more thing, I just saw um, Ariel comment something. Uh, the values and target of the influencer need to match with the service or product. Completely on point. People tend to just throw influencers at something and hope that it sticks, like I said before, but that's not how it works. You really need to see, you know, if you're working with an influencer, you know, you need to track, you know, what are they actually teaching their audience? And are they teaching or are they selling? Are they make, saying, buy this now? Or are they telling you, you know, how you know, why this is such a great product and, and giving you the resources to do your own research. You know, there's certain things that go into it. And I, and I agree with that statement that was said uh, in the comments. So just wanted to add that. Cool. Yeah. I really like that. that, that uh, like it's really cool to have like all these different, like, all, like a very synergistic uh, kind of feel of uh, the influencers in like web three space is uh, it's really cool. It's like, it's uh, yeah. I think influence is, is very difficult it's like it's like it's very unpredictable uh, what results you're gonna get, and you never you you never really know uh, the if the audience is like like you guys saying is like matches the uh, the uh, actual product or the actual like company that it's going in. And like I personally come from uh, marketing that's like programmatic and like more like uh, I, I kind of get excited over like sales uh, personally. Like it get, that gets me like really out of bed in the morning. Like oh we need a sale. Like let's go, 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 go. Like I like I really like like scaling sales, and so like I've really like I, I really have a lot of respect for uh, the like people who like uh, really specialize in the influencer side. I know it's like it's a, a lot of work and a lot of uh, uh, back and forth, and uh, uh, 
that's like a skill that I've never really like developed. But like, I think like it's, yeah, it's getting really like, really like kind of more obvious that like, if you're going to be doing it, you should have a really good approach and have a really good team uh, handling the influencer side. Cause it's uh, yeah, it's very, uh, uh, it feels very like, uh, like uh, you're kind of just gambling sometimes. And uh, like, if you even like some uh, like celebrity projects or like celebrity brands that they themselves really believe in and like promote like 24 seven, like uh, those, like, like you kind of see like, okay, that's like, that's kind of like the scale that's happening when they're personally like, fully vested uh like they're invested in the company they like believe in it and they're pushing all the time and so it's kind of like you can kind of i always get this feeling that's like it's like really powerful to have in tandem but yeah, you gotta have somebody who's like really knows what they're doing um in this market i think yeah you know w w one thing that to speak to that uh with the influencers you know you have to make sure you're, you don't become too heavily dependent on that as well right because you know, if you get lucky, you know, and things are matched right, you know, they can carry you for so long, but hype and somebody just saying, this is really great. This is really great. You got to get in here, right? That's only going to take you so long before someone says, okay, well, what's so great? Why is it so great? Like, like, <laughs> what, what, what is this? What is this? Exactly. And, 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 and they come in and they explore it, right? And, and reality sets in. So, yeah, just be careful on that. But, yeah, I, I agree all the way around with, with what, you know, everyone's saying. Yeah, so I definitely agree with you guys as well. I do think that influencers can definitely be a very good, you know, a part of a uh, overall marketing strategy and not just a standalone strategy. And the one, the other thing is that when um, you know project founders or people that have that doesn't have a lot of experience working with influencers, they tend to fall for the big numbers, right? So one thing that I always tell them is, from look at the engagement rate because there are a lot of influencers, especially on TikTok. On TikTok Twitter that have really big numbers and you know their tweets have like hundreds of thousands of retweets and, and comments but they're they're all you know low quality and most of them are fake you know so but definitely something that I always tell people don't you know don't um, don't fall for the big number right yeah. so take a look at the engagement take a look what they post are they consistent what kind of content what kind of tweets you know, just scroll back, you know, and make sure that this is the person you want to work with because these influencers are not cheap. You know, even on Twitter, for example, last week I was talking to a founder and he spent a lot of money on Twitter influencers with zero results. I mean, zero. And that's because, you know, like a very big percentage of that influencer's followers were bots and fake accounts. And that is how they basically scam other people that don't have a lot of knowledge and information or are not familiar how the web free space and how uh, influencers work, they fall for that. And that is, you know, such a shame because and not only did you, did, did you waste money, but time and, and you could have put that money in something that that would have worked instead. So that's one, that's one of the things that I always tell them. And secondly is that you have to find the right influencer for the... Uh, somebody mentioned that in the comments as well, because you don't want to have some kind of big lifestyle influencer, you know, promoting as a specific NFT or metaverse project. And one thing I am, I am seeing is the rise of virtual influencers. So um, uh, I, I can't remember the project anymore, but I've seen a project, I think especially in the, in the fashion industry or in the, in the metaverse fashion, uh, these virtual influencers are really coming up, so that could be that could be an interesting development to see that we are no longer no longer using human influencers, so to speak, but more virtual influencers. I don't know about you guys what you think about virtual influencers, but I think that, that would become a really big thing in the future. Yeah, I was, I was also going to mention like don't fall for that blue that blue check mark all the time too. Exactly. It's very it's very yeah. easy yeah. to buy that. You can uh, buy that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can buy it very easily. And not only that, I've seen so many people, even project founders I've spoken to for months, they, they, they were talking, we were holding their hand throughout the whole thing, and then boom, they got scammed by someone who had a verified check mark. Um, like yeah. I said, it's very easy to buy that online. So really make sure you do your vetting with these influencers. Also yeah. look at how, how much they post too, because for example, let's say you're on Twitter, 
um, and you and you have a promotion going on and that influencer is posting on a consistent basis, your tweet can get knocked down on their timeline pretty easily. And then not as many people will be seeing that. Right. So they, these are things we look for, too. Right. Is like how, how much do they post? How much do they engage? Um, are they actually uh, communicating with their audience? So on and so forth. Um, again, super important um, when you're trying to get your brand out there, your messaging um, and, and the news and events that you're trying to promote. Does anybody want to throw a dollar figure out like or, you know, how you get that blue check? Is it? Seven seven grand, seven seven grand, seven grand. Prices of 10 grand. Yeah. Yeah. So but, that's but also as everyone's aware to you. There's a new that I've seen like a uh, post of like new new like methods. There's, there's enough new verified like scam accounts at the moment that like. There's clearly a uh, like a, a either new process for getting those that's just like really uh, being abused like super hard because I've uh, I've noticed like probably more than I've ever seen uh, right now too like I think it's, yeah be really be really cautious it like check mark means like nothing uh, in the general um, uh, verification process anymore it's a uh, um, really kind of scary thing for sure. Oh, and I also want to touch on the the hype thing that was kind of mentioned too. Like, like you're right. Like with the hype of like an influencer, uh, where you lose that traction is like with hype. I like to think of it as like it's like if you can, it's like uh, if you're gonna do it, then you're you're gonna have to have like the full movie. Like you can't just you can't just like show one or two scenes and uh, uh, keep that energy alive. Like you have to you 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 be, you have to like come prepared to like uh, basically strategize a like a full movie sequence uh all the way so so like you, if you're going to go with the influencer angle i think you have to should come with like the bigger budgets and uh, a more strategic longer term approach that uh yeah. really hits hard i see glenn yeah. asking how much the, the dollar figure would be when it comes to influencer marketing and it really depends on whether you're trying to target for the micro uh influencers all the way up to to the larger influencers too i've seen people spend anywhere from uh you know five hundred dollars and offering a couple of whitelist spots to just smaller micro influencers that have a really really dedicated community to spending on just one influencer alone over fifty thousand dollars so it really depends on the route and, uh where you're going to take in the budget obviously uh, and your goals overall so yeah yeah i want to touch that on as well that's a good point always ask them you know for previous campaigns and results they've achieved right and always uh, check also what you get for for you know for the money. So make sure that you have you know agree, a written agreement before, uh, before yeah before you uh, engage with an influencer before you decide to hire that person. And as I mentioned as well, influencers can be really cheap, like a few hundred dollars up to. I've actually seen influencers ask like a million dollars for just you know a few posts. Uh, so yeah, that's ridiculous to be honest, but. Yeah, really a very wide range. Yeah, and <clears throat> I just wanted to touch in on, on that as well. Um, truly, uh, how much money you should maybe put into it, it really, like like they were saying, like it really depends on exactly what you're trying to achieve and who you're trying to target. Um, I've, like like, like uh, you were saying, um, I've seen an influencer. Uh, I, I don't know the name, but I, obviously, but I, I've seen an influencer charge like, a Bitcoin, two Bitcoins, just for a couple tweets. And I was like, how is this even like logical to some people? And people pay it. And and that's what's crazy. They don't understand that, you know, just because someone's asking for that much doesn't mean that they're, you know, 600, 700, 800K followers are actually that tight knit and dedicated to what they're posting. And that's where I feel like a lot of people get wrong is, um, you know, the micro, if you're, if you're really going for a campaign, uh, it really, you have to decide like, if you're going to target these micro uh, influencers or these bigger influencers. And yeah, that's, that's just my opinion on it. Awesome. I wanted to, let's see, we had, um, Oh, I'm on the wrong piece of paper. Oh, I wanted to, I wanted to just, um, Stan, if you, I know you always put out like, awesome, awesome material. I would love to hear Thank more you. about the virtual influencers. Like, and I, and I've seen some of that stuff like cropping up. I think I saw an article, uh, maybe in China, there's an, there's a virtual influencer ha who has like an insane amount of like um, uh, uh, you, know, you know deals, and and that that sort of also brings up something we were previously talking about, and it's like does story transcend? Like it doesn't matter apparently, right? If 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 the person is human or not, it's the story that is still capturing yep. the fantasy. 
Yeah, exactly. That you you see that it do, yeah you're right. It doesn't make a difference because, uh, for example, there's a really famous uh, fashion uh, virtual influencer called Mika a little Michaela. I'm sure most people have heard about. Her, I think um, she's really big in fashion, and she was created, and there was the whole story you know created around her, and that made her so popular. And now you see the rise, so to speak, of other. Uh, virtual influencers, uh, which I also posted about, you know, about, uh, for example, there was this, I can't remember the studio anymore, I think something like AI, AI Humans or something like that, um, that created also another influencer, Zero, that's really popular on, on Twitch and gained like 40k followers within a few weeks or something like that. So yeah, that it, it really doesn't matter. We are going to a place that it doesn't matter whether it's a real human or a virtual reality uh, yeah, I, person. I think, like, from the trend standpoint, it's really cool. I, I always love looking at, like, future trends with the way marketing is going to go and the way, obviously, the world is going to go in terms of the blockchain Web3 space. Um, and, and, and again, like, like Richard said earlier, you know, creating that future-proof community experience, like, how cool would it be to, to have events with, with influencers uh, for your own project and, and have that that community experience, right? Building that that um, that really unique experience to all, not only connect their audience, but that but your own uh, smaller community's audience together and create something amazing. And um, yeah, I I I don't know if we're gonna go into trends and things like that. I would love to speak about that too, but I'll, mm -hmm. I'll stop from there. <laughs> you know the and I do want to I do want to cover that. I also want to just. Um, I want to address, uh, so Glenn and Aaron, your questions are very sort of similar. They come from the same place. Uh, you know, we're talking about bootstrapping a project, right? With low to no budget, essentially, are we scaling up through a mint sale? And then we'll tack on Glenn's question there as well, right? Should we be campaigning in the early stage or wait till we have a product? Can I jump in on that one? Uh, so I think like that's the biggest, probably the biggest trap of all time that I personally like and had fallen into many, many times on, on uh, projects that I was like uh, trying to create myself in the uh, um, technology space and uh, is like thinking that you need to uh, go and build the product or you should go and build the product before you offer it. I think that uh, you always like, like as a rule should always uh, like spend almost 90% of your time working on getting sales first. Because once you get sales, you actually have uh, proven that that's actually what the market wants you to build. And, uh, so as long as like you personally, uh, are like going, are, are like going to follow through, make it happen, uh, just, like have faith that you, that it doesn't, is like building things isn't that hard. And the more money you have, the easier and faster you're going to be able to build it. So like, I, I personally have like in the camp that, uh, like pre-sales, uh, all day, uh, and, and never, uh, feel that you have the, uh, like never, put that overhead of building something uh, before you have market proof, because uh, if you haven't like done the correct uh, category alignment and you're building, then you, you really are uh, coming in with not enough knowledge uh, for the, the uh, space as well. So, so it's kind of a, uh, it's like really important, I think, to look at um, putting your time into like the sales portion. Like, you don't even need a website to get sales uh going uh, in my opinion like, i think the the sales part is uh, probably the most uh, most important thing yeah to kind uh, of... i agree oh sorry yeah. i didn't mean that <laughs> I was just say also the, a lot of the community like lauren alan govin like they're all agreeing right early early get started don't yeah, wait. I, yeah. I was gonna say like i so there's this project and i'll, I'll kind of shout them out a little bit um it's called the central web um you know they they uh when i first saw them uh, they had a very uh, small community to start, and this uh, they're on the NFT domain side, um, you know, following in the, uh, well, actually building upon the ENS, what it is now ENS, they're having their largest month ever in terms of NFT domain sales. Um, and so, you know, they have a caliber team, and, and one of the things is obviously their, their product uh, was not fully developed yet. And so I was uh, part of their project um, in, in, from the investor side. Um, since the early stages. And one of the key things that I love to see and many investors themselves, and I'm sure everyone else can, can talk about this, is showing proof of work throughout the whole entire phases and being very open with your community about everything. I've seen projects, and Steve and I have been investing in projects where 
um, you know, they, they promise the whole world to everyone in the community and then end up saying, oh, guys, we didn't know a video game takes a year to, <laughs> to build and all this stuff. We're sorry. And then everyone's like, ah, you know, expecting everything to, to go on the roadmap. So I think aligning everything up uh, on a realistic level and making sure you scale out. And then on top of that, communicating effectively with your community on an open basis um, is very key on that end. I, I, I Like I said, the central web was very well. I've been a part of their community since the beginning um, and they've been pretty open. So it's, it's stuff like that I love to see in projects. And that's why I wanted to shout them out too, because it's, it's really cool, with, um, you know, how they've been going along and building their community over time. Yeah, yeah I definitely agree with, uh, with you guys as well. I always tell them to start now as early as possible with strategy in the community building because a lot of people and a lot of founders, when I'm talking to them, they really underestimate how much time it costs to build, build a really strong uh, community and to keep them engaged and keep them, you know, and to nurture them as well because, you know, a strong community is long-term value because, some, you know, most of the project founders I'm talking about, I'm talking to, they are like, oh, we want to launch in like four weeks and I'm like, do you, do you have something? Do you have a community? Do you have Marketing strategy, no, we don't. And yeah, it just sounded realistic, right? I mean, it takes, you know, well thought out strategy. It takes time and it takes, you know, dedication and energy. You need really good moderators and community managers. You need, you know, it is really an art in itself, actually, to build a big, strong community. So that's why I always want to take the time to build it and, and not rush it. Otherwise, you will just get a lot of low quality, you know, followers and low quality community members. So, yeah, and, and that's why yes. it's, it's, it's really important to, to remember that we're in a, a new stage right now. Oh, am I on? Or is, Steve, are you on? I don't know. Okay. Sorry, okay. Rich, my bad. <laughs> All right. That we're in a new stage right now where, again, like, you know, maybe like six months ago or so up to that point, you were getting, it seemed like we were able to get by with 30% with preparation and, 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 you know, 70%, you know, actually performing, right? Actually doing, doing the whole thing where now I think you're going to see preparation is going to be, you know, normally it's 80% it's preparation, right? I mean, I think you're going to see that step up to 80 to 90% preparation because we're coming out of a, of a very fragile state where people will be a little bit for the, for the, for, for the, you know, foreseeable future, you know, near future will be a little bit scared, a little fragile, mistrusting, you know, and they, they we need to assure them and, and bring them back. And that's why you're going to see preparation and data and projects in motion. And, and again, start as soon as you can, right? Time really, you know, just like Josh was saying, you know, getting in there, seeing how the market reacts, seeing if, if there's anything. And then also I will say like Google Trends, right? Google Trends is amazing for, for not, not just searches on, you know, what you want, is, is it popular? But, but also artists, if you're going to invest, you know, projects, you can look at trends, right? And see like searches nationwide, worldwide, things like that. And then, you know, really make things realistic and focus on, on just the, 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 the points that are necessary, right? So a lot of people will come in and they'll try to do something really, really big. And they'll, they'll go like, hey, I want to have five models. I want to go and show them all this. And I'm always saying, hey, let's keep it simple, right? Let's focus on that one model. Let's do something really great and build up. We don't, because it's, it's about focusing your resources and what can you do realistically to go and show that you have a product like an MVP that everybody can relate to. And then how do you build that bridge? Right? So the biggest thing is all throughout your process is figuring out how can you build, you know, that bridge, like the digi bridge effect to actually get to your message to the masses and to connect. And, and also, you know, the, the sale, you know, for a project. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think a website or some kind of landing page, um, that would be great to get some commits, right? So what, you know, you can along the way, like the biggest thing in the crypto NFT crowd, right? You can't just buy mailing. Like this is not like traditional marketing, right? This is more intimate. This is more secretive as well, right? You can't just buy a mailing list for these individuals. So getting, finding ways to interact and build out your, your data, uh, through, you know, different pages, uh, you know, like a landing page with a, a, a contact form, you know, some information there, whitelist, you can be you know, made aware of different drops different things like that. And then also, you know, hybridized pull-offs, things like that to, to engage people, motivate them to do different things, you know, AMAs and things like that while you're building up your project and connecting with your community and then finding ways to organically ripple them out, right? So, yeah, beautiful. And, cool. and Josh and Steven, if you don't mind, I actually want to just, I want to key on something Rich said there with our last 10 minutes. Uh, let's, and actually, let me, let me just get off of um, your 
there we are. Um, I want to I want to talk a little bit about like cadence and community building, right? Towards a sale or even mm -hmm. post sale, and sort of uh, talk about the psychological aspects of it, the science aspects about it, right? Like, and then talk a little bit about like how do you think about dripping content, like in in what's that? So I want to start. Um, I'll start with Sten, and and we'll go down on the left hand side, gentlemen. Yeah. So for me, the the science behind it is actually not focused on necessarily the very big numbers, right? Because a lot of projects, or at least at least a lot of founders, they want to have like 100k people in the Discord community, for example, when they start to mint. But it's all about quality for me, and it's always about quality. And basically, what you want is to have this personal relation with every member. Uh, of course, you don't have personal relation with every community member, but that's the mindset that I have when, you know, when I'm starting a community, when I'm building community and when I'm reaching out to people. I really want to, you know, know them and I want to talk with them. Um, and that is that is basically how I built. And I've seen really big communities like 100K, 80K people in the Discord, you know, fail their mint uh, and uh, fail to sell out or fail to sell even, you know, 1,000 NPs, 500 NPs. Well, smaller communities like they had like two or 3,000 people in their, in their Discord and, you know, they sold out within minutes. And another thing that I think is very important is not to stare blindly just at Discord because, yes, Discord definitely works, but it doesn't mean it is the best channel for your community, right? I mean, there are other channels like Reddit and even, you know, LinkedIn has become more and more of a platform that are, that people are using, you know, to uh, to communicate with their community. So, yeah, I think I think it's all about where are the people, you know, where, the, where are the people hanging out that I want to reach, you know, what kind of people do I want to reach and what kind of people do I want to engage with? I think it's all about finding you know, the right balance and, and not stare blindly on just Discord or Twitter. I mean, of course, those are two definitely help and very, they are very active, but they are not always necessarily the best channels in my opinion. Yeah, and I want to just key on something that Ariel said, Mark, will go right to you, but um, yes, to stop and just be okay with silence and no action. I can speak to this personally from the resistance now. Like, I at times feel this need to push content but I need to also sometimes not and let the community do its thing. And, and that is often like where you see the best results because the, the members pick it up and they start and like, and that's really important in communities where like, there's not, there's somebody maybe like putting things together and helping it along, but, but there's no head of the snake. Right. And, um, and, and that can be difficult also to understand from being a community manager of like, you got to step back sometimes and, and let them do their thing. So. With that, yeah, I think from like a longevity standpoint, um, one of the things I love to see and I don't see that much of is, for example, a lot of a lot of projects or many of the projects I've seen and talked with, they say that they're community led, right? And then I go into their Discord and their community is not even helping with any of the activities regarding marketing or even um, looking at ways to help further uh, create more success for that business in general. Um, and so I think one of the things for uh, longevity is to also contribute your community to your marketing efforts. Um, I've, we've done, I've done campaigns before, uh, you know, DigiBridge has done campaigns before in the past where we've created PR kits for our community members, interviewed the top, uh, you know, members of, uh, of that community and then have, have them basically spider web out um, and create content for us and do things of that nature to really push it organically in that end. And I don't see enough of that with a lot of these projects, um, having the, not only the community, the process of onbo onboarding and, and maintaining that longevity for the community to keep pushing the marketing end organically to having that uh, awareness spread out there, but also onboarding processes for um, community management, right? Because you have all these, everyone here, right? They're, they're owning, uh, these entities are, are the sticking points to their loyalty. Uh, with your brand and and um, they're they're brand advocates and and if they're extremely loyal um, to that brand, why not have a process to bring them onto the team to help uh, manage the community uh, over time to train them and to do certain things like that? Have specific channels um, made out for these um, individuals um, again to to really have that that holistic push on that end rather than that just one off. 
um, that I see some of these projects um, doing that in. So that's just a little bit of my uh, takeaways from that longevity standpoint, including the community with your efforts in both the marketing and the development standpoint and, and trying to really, um, really push everyone together forward. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. What do you got to say, Josh? Cool. Okay. I totally agree. I think like, um, yeah, I'm great, great, glad we could dive a little bit deeper into that is like, uh, I think that the longer you have uh, to strategize and put things together, the more effective and powerful your end result will be. And uh, I think that like with community building as well, like it's really cool, like, um, like to have, a, like spend the time to like develop the community identity uh, before you uh, take it through uh, and make sure that there's a, a lot uh, to be said about what the purpose of that community is and what, what his goal is. Like, what are we trying to accomplish as a group that we can't do on our own? Uh, like, it's kind of like, uh, like uh, you guys are saying, like, like some discords, like the, like, you just kind of like, you're not, like, it's like, they're just not, nothing's really going on. You're kind of posting, they're posting stuff. And uh, it's really kind of uh, people are just there waiting. And it's like a babysitting camp, like when they're bored. But, like, there's other communities that, um, have harnessed like the identity and like the tribe uh, of like what the purpose is and where the direction is. And I think like the harnessing uh, the community as like kind of like part of the team uh, is really important. Like you kind of, it's like uh, uh, when you're like taking on a, taking a company to like a global market of like 7 billion people or something, you and uh, your company size will probably needs to be like thousands and thousands of people eventually. So like, why not take, uh, enable the thousand people or 2000 people or 10,000 people to uh, um, like be the uh, driving force. Like it's the, the like the best uh, uh, free uh, like employee system. Uh, like you basically like um, creating a way to uh, enable uh, them to have a strong purpose and identity and to drive the community uh, just by like enabling them. Like, like I think like the, uh, like you have the perfect, you also have the perfect user feedback loop. Like, like we could like, like if we're doing that, like in a big company, we're like paying like thousands and thousands of dollars for that user feedback. And like, it's, and it's also like biased. You have like all these different, uh, uh, challenges and and you, you like it was a fresh group or not versus like as you're saying as you guys are all saying like taking the time and getting that uh involvement so it's like a more of a group collective effort and 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 like getting that like feedback loop going where like you're actually like working together to uh push something forward and, and get something done absolutely absolutely and rich yeah, uh, so community, I mean, that's one of my, my favorite aspects of, of what we're doing, right? I mean, I really kind of, you know, being, you know, having well over, I think, 1,500 NFTs and being in several hundred projects, you know, we're really looking anymore to create that experience that we've been looking for the whole time. Um, and, and I think really what it comes down to initially, right, is your foundation, your roadmap. So your roadmap allows you to have a linear experience, right? So what you're looking for is something that's really simple. Uh, we're not looking for like, hey, I'm going to take you to the moon. I'm going to take you here. Just let's show me some simple steps that you can do for at least the, th the first three months. Um, and then for, 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 you know, preferably with a community, right? Who doesn't like to have some influence over your experience and your investment, right? So we try to bring it into a more community-led experience. And, and that's the biggest thing, you know, with all of that, uh, you know, having like orbital software, uh, AI and different elements to where, again, like, like you're... When we come into a community, the first thing, right, is to find your most passionate, loyal supporters as quickly as possible. Find them, extract them. Those are the ones that will help you. They will support you. They will, the ones that are willing to just do it because they love you, right? Get those people, and just as Mark was saying, like, we, we, we find those tribal leaders. We even give them the PR kits that we create for the companies. They voice it. We have a, a synchronized campaign. But then from that, right, what are we looking for? So, so everyone that we're looking for, we're trying to create a sustainable competitive advantage with high barriers to entry that's hard to imitate, right? So you're trying to create future-proof experiences, sustainable. And the other thing is about building the bridge. So the whole thing about a lifestyle, right? We want this to be the one, right? This, this is how everybody is, is thinking right now. It, it, there is going to be cannibalization projects, you know, communities gobbling up, raiding communities. So how do we make this the one? How do we make it so this is future-proof, that this is going to be something? So a lot of that even is creating a lifestyle campaign, right? 
showing how this brand, the individuals, the players, that you know, the, the community, how awesome it is and how great it is, how the, how the utility is raining down supreme on the community, right? Getting us out there. That is adding value. Then also building in hodling mechanics, right? So like, again, it's the 80-20 rule, right? So you, you make normally marketing 80% from your 20%, right? So really, if you look at it and you, not so much random, right? Random rewards the masses. You need to really figure out how many mechanics for you. You reward the masses, but also at least 10% of your collection, you know, of your community, like the top 10%, and that can be ever-changing. They can be competing for those spots that maybe they get things like, ooh, all-inclusive utility, things like this that make people compete. And, and, and then you broadcast, you show how amazing the experience is for these people so that people, when they offer them a million dollars, they're like, I'm not letting go of that. No way. Do you see? Uh, no way. So anyways, that's where you're trying to take it right now, right? You're trying to create that experience that, again, nobody wants to let go of because it's so amazing. And again, a lot of that comes from the community. The community has it. We don't have to recreate the wheel. We don't have to do rocket science here. Let the community take it. But, but again, you need a strategy. You can't just come in there and say, oh, we're going to let it do its own thing. No, it needs to be managed, right? And again, like we have amazing teams that you know we're coming from right now that are yeah, I, I'll leave it at that, but, but yeah, community yeah. where it's at, and, and we'll see some beautiful things where these NFTs are going to be collector's passes for your clubs, and these are memberships to the most amazing things you could ever imagine, and I was just out in LA, right, so I went to NFT LA, I was at the fuck render parties, right, I was at the big event, FaZe Banks was there, movie stars were there, NFL football players were there, when I came back from LA, I doubled down, I bought, oh my gosh, you can see my, 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 my you know, look at my wallet, my collection, they're published, I'm doxxed, you can mm -hmm. see, but and NFT NYC, I'm speaking there again, right? So I mean, all the way around, I am. I, I love what's coming. I am so for what is coming. Don't give up. Art has been. It will always be the NFTs. It's just the beginning. Buckle up, my friends. Great things are to come. Awesome. And Stephen, awesome. why don't you uh, add us on there at, at the end here? Yeah, for sure. So, um, in addition to you know what Richard was saying, you know, managing. Um, I want to mention that, you know, managing expectations, a lot of projects seem to lack uh, the ability to manage expectations among their community. Um, you know, and where I think this can go from, um, first of all, uh, another thing is, you know, making sure, you know, as an investor and as a community member, you are an extension of this project. So utilizing them to become, you know, something bigger than just another person who's holding your NFT, another person who's buying your token, you know, making sure you're actively participating and getting people to participate. And, you know, this can be used, let's say you have a content creation team, but you're lacking budget for certain things. You can make a marketing vault and have, you know, you can post your content in there and say, Hey guys, use this hashtag and post it around this time uh, for, you know, giveaway or whatever it is. And people will do it because you're incentivizing them. And it's something that they want to actually see and want to actually do. And, you know, I, I just feel like, you know, what I love in this space is transparency, uh, being clear, cut straight to the point, but also managing the expectations, making sure if you're making like a game, for example, you're not saying, oh, it's coming, you know, soon. Uh, if it's not, if it's going to take like a year to build or whatever, you know, people that's that's I'll leave it at that. But yeah, I, I really think expectations, transparency and clear cut communication, along with, you know, making sure you're utilizing your community is the most important aspect. Um. Awesome. 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 All right. Well, you know, as usual, we ran a little late, but I don't think anybody's going to get on our case too much here. Um, I want to just give a big shout out to the community. We ended up actually getting, getting 186 registrations uh, for the event. I know that in big part was because of, uh, you know, my esteemed panelists. Once again, I just want to um, give them each a shout out and, and you know, thank you uh, for, for joining this and then also just being um, such staunch report, you know, supporters of the resistance. Um, everybody else, we are also doing a event tonight. Um, so we're going to be uh, on with Jamie Harford um, from Inverse Funding, and he's going to have the whole hour. He'll be taking your questions. So early stage founders, right? Uh, definitely jump on here. Hit us with your questions. Jamie is just an incredible resource, uh, and I'm really glad that he's been able to join the community and give us an hour of his time. Uh, Besides that, if you are listening to this somewhere on planet Earth and you have not joined the resistance, you need to rectify that immediately. So go ahead. Uh, I'm sure you can dig around my profile or I'll put out a comment on this as well, uh, just so you can find that and join the resistance. And then to end it up, I promise, that's my dog in the background. I, what we're going to end up doing here is I'm going to put together a post 
and we'll call out Stan and Mark and Josh and Richard and Steve. And we're going to, we're going to make sure that you guys can get a hold of their LinkedIn pages and their websites. And please show them a little bit of love, follow their pages, hit their websites up so they can hit you with those retargeting ads uh, and, and, you know, hopefully become customers. So, uh, adieu everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you guys. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks.